To get a first-hand look at peacekeeping in action, we've traveled to the heart of Africa, to the most ambitious United Nations mission in the world, the Congo. It's a vast, rugged place with very few roads and even less law and order. It's poor and war-torn. The UN's job? Secure it. Welcome to peacekeeping in the 21st century. We're out here at what's called a TOB. It's a temporary operating base. There's about 50 soldiers here. They're only going to be here for about a week before they move on to another hilltop. And you can see that the people here feel safe now that these soldiers are here. The problem is there's thousands of hilltops like this all over the Congo. The UN can't possibly put a base on every one. And for every hilltop in Congo, there are countless other hilltops and conflict zones around the world. Today, the UN has more peacekeepers in more places than ever before, a record 115,000 men and women reporting for duty. It's a far cry from what UN peacekeeping used to look like, relatively small UN forces standing between two armies, monitoring a peace deal. The UN got very good at that. But today, the job is much more complex in a chaotic new landscape of failing states, shifting battle lines, and unpredictable combatants, the UN is struggling. One of the things you learn here in Congo is that the situation changed rapidly. You, one day you have a, a huge violence, the other day it's already the thing is calm. Mm -hmm. It's like the weather. You have sun and you have immediately rain, and that's it. It's an outright thunderstorm when you look at what the UN has orders to do in Congo enforce a fragile peace deal, disarm the rebel groups who often break it, train Congo's ragtag police force, and rehabilitate its notoriously abusive national army. All this and more with just 17,000 troops in a country as big as the eastern United States with 60 million people. And it is the people who are the UN's top priority here. The UN has what's called a mandate, a direct order to protect them from harm. Well, the United Nations has one of the strongest mandates in the world in eastern Congo. And so Almost nobody knows this part of the world better than Annika van Woudenberg, a lead researcher for Human Rights Watch. She spends much of her time in Congo, documenting its brutal war and observing the UN. They have what is called a Chapter 7 mandate, which means that UN peacekeepers can use force in order to protect people. So if people are at risk and the armed militias are coming, the UN can open fire. It's rare that we see such a strong mandate. Giving peacekeepers the power to use force to protect civilians is a response to a devastating litany of UN failures to do just that. First, in Rwanda, where close to a million were slaughtered. And then, just over a year later, in Bosnia, where thousands were executed, both in the presence of UN troops. Since those dark days, there have been successes, notably in war-ravaged countries like Liberia and East Timor. But compared to those places, Congo is on another level entirely. The sheer size and complexity of the mission, combined with the explicit orders to protect civilians, make the Congo a definitive challenge for the United Nations. This is a true test case. If this UN mission cannot do this adequately and is not seen to be able to do this adequately, we have to start to question peacekeeping in other parts of the world. So if Congo is a test case, then it is here, in a town called Kiwanja, that the UN failed the exam. By late last October, the UN had built a base here, a key crossroads and a scene of fierce fighting. Rebels took the town on November 5th without the UN ever firing a shot. Many of Kiwanja's residents ran for their lives. Some who did not paid the price as the rebels carried out a bloody revenge campaign. House to house, door to door, they started slaughtering them. They killed them with machetes, with guns, with spears, whatever they could find. They beat some to death. And at the end of the day, more than 150 people had died. And all this less than one mile from the base where 100 UN troops were stationed. Troops who had explicit orders to use force to protect the people. According to Annika van Woudenberg's research, the UN force in Kiwanja lacked armored vehicles, didn't have the intelligence to track and counter rebel movements, and didn't even have enough translators. So when the local people came and said, people are being killed, there are problems, 
they could only communicate via gestures. So the local people would come and would go, they're cutting their throats, you know, we're being killed. And the UN peacekeepers could understand this sign, but couldn't really understand who was doing it or what was happening. To find out for ourselves what had gone so terribly wrong in Kiwanja, we went to the scene of the massacre. In a hilltop neighborhood, high above town, residents showed us these pits, where they say rebels tried to hide some of the dead. At the time, Marie was in a nearby hospital, giving birth to twins. Her husband had come home to get her a change of clothes. When he arrived home, the shootings began. The rebels began kicking in doors and killing people. I heard that news at the hospital. I waited and waited, hoping to see my husband, but I haven't ever seen him again. Were the UN forces here supposed to protect you and your family and your neighbors from the rebels? They didn't come to protect us. Local human rights worker Jonathan Impigi says he called the base for help in the middle of the massacre, but was told there was nothing the UN could do. If there are more problems in Kiwanja, what do you think will happen next time? We don't have any more confidence in the United Nations. We'll have to look after ourselves and hide in our homes. That's all. It is tragic in any circumstance where the UN is present, uh, where civilians become the victims of violence. Susan Rice has come to the UN to make some changes as the Obama administration's new ambassador. She told us that making the UN work better is vitally important to the United States. Often the other alternative to the United Nations is that we do nothing and that these conflicts fester uh, and spill over and create an environment in which extremists and criminals can operate, uh, where terrorists can find safe haven. So we have a stake uh, in the successful resolution of conflicts, even in parts of the world that may seem distant and far-flung to the average American. But Ambassador Rice admits, in light of recent failures, the UN's peacekeeping capacity is stretched thin. The number of complex challenges that the UN is trying to tackle uh, is greater. And yet the number of troops that the, uh, the world has been able to muster to fulfill the mandates that we in the Security Council have given it uh, is not infinite. And so there's a gap, a growing gap between supply and demand. A growing gap, that much is clear. But around UN headquarters in New York, the choice of words is even stronger, that peacekeeping is in crisis, at a breaking point. And you might be surprised by just who is saying this. A number of our mission face risks that are so significant that there is a potential for mission failure with terrible consequences for the whole United Nations. That startling admission comes from Alan Lavoie, the man in charge of all UN peacekeeping operations worldwide, the man whose job it is to get this right. It has increased drastically in the last year. And you know things are bad when a top UN official is willing to admit that he has a problem. Is the Security Council responsible for asking you to do more than is possible by setting up these huge mandates, by asking for too many missions? Is it setting peacekeeping up to fail? It is clear that the decision maker is the Security Council. I don't think the Security Council is sending us in places where we shouldn't go, but we, we would like very much uh, a continuous support from members of the Security Council and, and uh, uh, additional member states from the UN to make sure we have the adequate resources to perform the mandate that the Security Council decides. The resources Lois is fighting for are exactly what the UN's top man in Congo says he needs. Alan Doss took me on a helicopter tour to a few of his more remote and vulnerable bases, like here in Kanya Bayonga, on the front lines of a new rebel advance. The UN is trying to stop this place from becoming another Kiwanja. Is the UN overstretched in Congo? Well, we're pretty stretched. I don't know if that we'd call it overstretched. You know, we know we can't be everywhere all of the time. We can't have a soldier in every field, every behind every tree. So we have to use our resources as cleverly as possible. Part of the problem is the UN doesn't have its own army. Every time the Security Council okays a new mission, it has to ask countries to volunteer troops. Never an easy task. Case in point, 
Last fall, just before the Kiwanja massacre, Doss came to New York pleading for reinforcements. The Security Council quickly authorized 3,000 more troops. But as of this broadcast, more than six months later, those extra boots are still not on the ground, and neither is the equipment to support them. In the package that the Council approved last October at my request were 18 helicopters. I haven't had a single offer yet. Months ago now, though, why, yeah, isn't, months, why well, isn't it here? It's the same that I mentioned, you know, you've got to knock at all those doors and uh, negotiate then with the country's concerned. We have no standing force. Uh, you know, we don't have the Pentagon here. Um, I can't order up an aircraft carrier or something. We bring our reports to members of the UN Security Council. When she's not in the Congo, Human Rights Watch's Annika van Woudenberg is often at the UN, trying to push countries to put their money where their mouths are. These are the very countries that when they pass these resolutions to give the ability to use force, they're the same nations that will not give the United Nations those very troops to do so. The UN is dependent on third world countries for the troops to these missions. They don't have European forces. They don't have American forces, which have better logistical capabilities, which can move more quickly. So sure, it's easy to criticize the UN, but the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, they're not stepping up to put their troops in Congo. The vast majority of the troops in Congo come from India, Pakistan, South Africa, Nepal, and Uruguay. In fact, only 2% of all UN troops in Africa come from North America and Europe. Fewer soldiers from rich nations means fewer resources, because the UN also owns almost no equipment. Member states supply everything from trucks to helicopters, tanks to night vision goggles. And what does the United States contribute? Well, money, more than any other nation, picking up more than a quarter of the UN's $8 billion peacekeeping bill. Ambassador Susan Rice says it's money well spent. If the United States were to act on its own unilaterally and deploy its own forces in, in many of these contexts, uh, for every dollar that the United States would spend, the United Nations can accomplish the mission for 12 cents. That's a good bargain for the American taxpayer. Rice says that under her watch, the U.S. will mend fences with the U.N. and bolster peacekeeping. Is this a moment for the United States to hit a reset button? with the United Nations? I think we, this is a term that has is, is gotten some use in other contexts. And, and yes, it is a moment for the United States to renew its leadership internationally uh, and a moment to see that manifest here in the United Nations. What specifically is the U.S. going to do to help rebuild peacekeeping? As I mentioned, there's a supply and demand gap. Uh, there's something of a quality gap. And the United States can increase and, and sustain our support uh, for the training and equipping of, 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 the, of soldiers uh, and, and specialized units from countries that are able and willing to contribute them. We can play a much more uh, effective role to ensure that the mandates given these operations are, are, are uh, achievable, well-crafted and scoped so that we're not asking the organization in the future to take on responsibilities that we can't reasonably expect it to fulfill. But what we're not going to see is American combat troops on the ground in a UN mission. That hasn't happened since Black Hawk Down, the Somalia debacle of 1993. And so the UN must continue to rely on countries willing to send troops. And here's where the problem can get even worse. Some of these countries actually restrict what their troops can do and where they can go before they're even deployed. And it's there that some of the troubles start, right? So we have some troop contributing countries who will say, yes, well, I'll send this many, but only to this area. Or I will send this many, but not with helicopters. And so then we find that it's a patched together UN peacekeeping operations with all of the faults that we see in the field in Congo. It can be a logistical nightmare for commanders in the field who are sometimes at the mercy of other countries' rules. I understand that some, some of them, they cannot fly in, in the night, and uh, which is, of course, is a constraint for military, because if you have a risky mission, you, you need to be extra people in the night, you have to. But you know, it's the way UN is. I'm, 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 understand, I'm afraid that I cannot go further now on this, <laughs> this issue. Maybe the colonel can't go further, but his boss is pretty frank about how these deals can drag down a mission. I get very frustrated myself, and I'm on the phone and banging away there. We have a memorandum of agreement with every country that sends troops to the mission, and we have many countries here. 
uh, that regulates where they're going to be, what they're going to do, how they're going to be equipped and so forth. If we want to change that, we have to consult that country. That takes time. But time is exactly what this man says the UN does not have. You have the old days of peacekeeping, and you have the peacekeeping anno 2009. Dutch Major General Patrick Kamert is fighting his own battle to reform UN peacekeeping, bringing a soldier's perspective to the current crisis. In peacekeeping, you're not launching a war, but I always said, in order to keep the peace, one has to enforce it sometimes. Uh, Kamert is now retired from active duty and lives in The Hague, but he speaks from years of experience wearing the blue beret of a UN peacekeeper in New York, Cambodia, Bosnia, and for two years as commander of UN troops in eastern Congo. That's where he pushed his mandate to the limit, launching aggressive and proactive operations he says prompted 18,000 rebels to turn in their weapons. General Khmer left the Congo before the Kiwanja massacre. Today, he is in disbelief over the failures at the heart of his old mission. He's convinced that if the UN wants to avoid another Kiwanja, then commanders must restore the active and engaged soldiering he demanded in the field. There were all sorts of excuses later why they didn't do it. But in my view, it is not so much the immediate uh, issue there, it is, it, you, 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 one should start studying the reasons why they didn't act a few months before. Because what was then the routine? Were the peacekeepers during the night on foot patrolling in that village? Yes or no? Were they seeing what was going on? Were they in contact with the local leaders, and the clan leaders and the village elderly so that they knew what was going on? Or were they driving in an APC from A to B and had no contact with the local population? So the explanation of we didn't have enough men, we didn't have a good translator, we didn't know what was going on, that's not good enough. For me, it's not good enough. And I know because I've been there. It's not good enough. Do you think commanders are too afraid of having body bags come home? I think that is, that is certainly uh, one of the reasons of their hesitation to really implement the mandate. So Khmer is adamant that UN leadership make it loud and clear that protecting the peace is risky business and that sometimes UN troops will die. Talk to the commanders, talk to the troops, uh, inform troop contributing countries and say, why are you sending troops? If you are sending troops because you think that it is a good thing to do, then you should accept that once in a while you might have a problem. Because you know, you're not going there to Club Mediterranean. Another point Khmer makes is that before commanders can succeed, the UN's notoriously inflexible bureaucracy has to be tamed. Khmer's own run-in with UN rules involved, of all things, helicopter doors. I had 30 uh, military aircraft helicopters at the command. But the rules and regulations of the United Nations are all for civilian helicopters. So if you want to land somewhere, then the rule said that you land at a certain place and you wait till you can switch off the rotor and then the ladder comes out and then you walk out of the helicopter. But you know, that doesn't work. In the eastern part of the Congo, when you are after rebels, you have to fly in with an open door so that you hover over a certain area. That is cursing in the Church of the United Nations because that is against the rules. After fighting for an entire year, Khmer received special waivers just to fly with his helicopter doors open. Is the UN bureaucracy not allowing for these smart adjustments on the ground? Is it too slow to respond to changing conditions? That's part of the reform I intend to, 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 to conduct and having um, uh, some reform adopted by, the, by this year is to try to give more flexibility to the troops on the ground, to their mobility and flexibility on the condition they operate. Meanwhile, back in Congo, there are signs that the UN is, in fact, responding to its failure in Kiwanja. Many of the changes are exactly what Khmer is calling for, changes the UN was very happy to show now's cameras. The UN force at the base in Kiwanja has quadrupled. <laughs> And a take charge new leader has been brought in, Colonel Ranbir from India. So we will have our whole night patrol for the next seven days in Matabo. It's okay to you? 
The colonel holds regular meetings with village elders and local chiefs, and he started night patrols on foot down the very lanes where the killings occurred. It is not lost on the population that there is a new sheriff in town. Thanks for the confidence, the motive. Try to build on the confidence. But it's also clear that this confidence building has a long way to go. <laughs> okay, he's saying that uh, sometimes they are patrolling only in the vehicles. They need to make also foot patrol. They want to see more men on foot here? You think that would make you feel safer? Yeah, they make themselves safer. Mm -hmm. Perhaps even more troubling is that in just a few weeks, Colonel Ranbir will already be back home in India, his UN service complete. Whether another reformer will continue his initiatives is unclear. Major General Khmer's own experience is not reassuring. What happened after you left the Congo? Well, unfortunately, there was no one to hand over my command because there was no replacement for six months. There was no replacement for six months? For six months, there was no replacement, which I think was... was uh, um, very difficult to swallow. So the momentum was lost. The, men, the momentum that was built up over two years was lost. So where does all this leave us? A massive mission in Congo with no end in sight, waiting for thousands more troops. A United Nations deeply in need of institutional change and renewed commitment from bottom to top, from member states to leadership. And most importantly, the people of the Congo and elsewhere, desperately hoping the troops in blue helmets will finally be able to deliver on the world's promise to protect them. Should we be surprised, though, if we hear of another failure of the UN to protect civilians? No. No. You can't be surprised because, in fact, uh, there isn't uh, sufficient uh, force capability on the ground in these conflict zones uh, to ensure that there will never be another instance of civilians killed in the presence of, of a United Nations mission. That's an, an unrealistic expectation. I think this is the sad reality for the people in Eastern Congo. Who do they turn to to help? Everyone seems to let them down, but yet they would keep a degree of faith in the United Nations. They, they put up their little houses, their little tents around the barbed wire outside of the base, even though they know sometimes the UN can't protect them. In many ways, the UN is the only hope for the people of Eastern Congo.